Good morning. I'm delighted to see you all. My name is Satohiro Akimoto. I am chairman and the president of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Thank you for attending our policy briefing series. Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA or Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the good of the international community. Before we begin the event, please allow me to briefly talk about meeting protocol. Today's event is on the record and it is being recorded. Video and recap will be posted on Sasakawa USA website. How to change screen view? Please manually change between speaker and gallery views. How to ask a question during Q&A? Use the raise hand found on the participant list. And please unmute your microphone when called upon. It was a shock to learn the Prime Minister Abe decided to step down for health reason at the end of the last month. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Abe for a long, meaningful, and consequential premiership. Prime Minister Abe was always gracious to Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, Nippon Foundation. He gave a talk at our event in Washington in 2015. Despite his busy schedule, he always find time to meet with the Congressional Study Group delegation to Japan, which we organized together with association of former member of the Congress. When uh, uh, we visited Japan this February, despite his busy schedule, he spent 45 minutes talking to each individual member of the delegation. I always learn a lot from my mentors and friends in town. Mere four days after Mr. Abe announced his intention to step down, Dr. Humry and Dr. Green had an insightful event at the CSIS. Dr. Humry said he would be forever grateful for Prime Minister Abe to step forward to carry the flag of progressive Western values, foundational values, when the US was confused and not leading. Mr. Abe, or Prime Minister Abe, is probably the most important Prime Minister since Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida in the post-war period. He is a consequential Prime Minister in several ways. One of his significance was that he talked about values and visions and many international leaders listened to him actually. I cannot remember any other Japanese prime minister in this respect. In order to do so, Prime Minister Abe must convey his thoughts in words and the logic which the international community can understand. Dr. Taniguchi closely worked with the prime minister in this respect. He's an expert of words and logic. We all remember Prime Minister Abe's paper, Asia's Democratic Security Diamond, just before he became Prime Minister for the second time in 2012. We of course all, all remember Japan is back speech at the CSIS, which Dr. Green mentioned in his event in 2013. Prime Minister Abe also spoke at the joint meeting of the Congress in 2015. He delivered speeches in Australia, India, and many other places in the world. Last Friday, Prime Minister Abe had dinner outside of family members for the first time in almost two months. Mr. Taniguchi, together with Mr. Takao, his interpreter, were among the guests at the table. This is significant because so many high-ranking advisors and friends of Prime Minister Abe visited him during the day to bid farewell, but most of them are 10 minutes, 20 minutes, short meetings. I take it as a sign 
how important it has been for Prime Minister Abe to express his views and values in the international community. He may think this is his biggest legacy as a Prime Minister. Mr. Taniguchi certainly play a major role in it. Dr. Taniguchi is a special advisor to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's cabinet. He's also a professor at the Keio University's Graduate School of System Design and Management. He also served as distinguished non-resident fellow at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, USA. Dr. Taniguchi, floor is yours. Go ahead, Dr. Taniguchi. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Akimoto. And thank you very much, Shanti and Benji, for making this happen. Um, tomorrow, at about uh, 40 minutes past noon, Shinzo Abe is going to step out, finally, of the Prime Minister's House, Prime Minister's office, uh, the Kante, to end his long term. I have been working with him for about uh, seven years and eight months. What am I feeling now? My senses, frankly speaking, I've been very much devastated by the fact that uh, uh, his term must end now. Looking back, that in 2013, uh, February 2013, Prime Minister Abe had to pronounce that Japan was back, speaks volumes, because I remember prior to that, uh, even uh, people like Rich Armitage uh, was wondering if Japan would ever come back as a first tier nation in the international uh, affairs. 2011, Japan was hit by a big quake followed by biblical tsunami waves and even uh, by the nuclear fiasco. A Japanese stock um, index nosedived uh, uh, beneath the line of um, 10,000 yen. Fewer still people, uh, both within Japan and without, expected that there would be any value uh, for them to invest in Japan, where people were hopeless, people had a sense of directionlessness, and young people didn't expect uh, a brighter days in their future. It was a classical uh, phenomenon of um, self-fulfilling downward spiral scenario. So Shinzo Abe's first priority was to give seeds of hope, whatever they may be, to the Japanese, without which you could not grow. Macroeconomics uh, textbooks all tell you that in order for any economy to grow, on the supply side, there are only three channels capital stock, labor input, and labor productivity. Uh, these days, uh, many call it total factor productivity. But for each one of these elements to grow, something more fundamental is necessary. That is hope. That is confidence. That is self-esteem and self-efficacy none of which was in ample supply back in 2011 and 12. Has he succeeded in doing so? 
the rest of my speech is going to be divided into two parts. I know many of you would be interested uh, more in uh, hearing from me about uh, Shinzo Abe's foreign policies, but may I just start addressing his economic policies, and that would constitute my first part. In the second part, I will uh, speak a little bit about uh, foreign policies as well. Why do I uh, emphasize on domestic economic policies? Because in order for anything to be pursuable, you must have a robust economy. And that's self, that self evident, but given the dire economic situation around 2011 and 12, uh, it was all the more important for Shinzo Abe to uh, 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 stress again and over and over again how important it is for Japan to grow. The report card is something like um, the following. <clears throat> Uh, on uh, PM Abe's watch, uh, Japanese uh, GDP has grown by 460 billion US dollars. Corporate uh, pre-tax profit by 400 billion US dollars. Private non-residential investment by 154 billion US dollars and tax revenue by the same number, 154 billion US dollars. This has all been very much important because Japanese budget, however big in size that may appear, indeed, if there were a country that could generate the same amount of money that the Japanese central government uses as its budget, uh, it uh, would rank the 17th in the world GDP ranking. Again, if there were a country that generates the same amount of Japanese budget as GDP, uh, it would be bigger than Turkey, bigger than Saudi Arabia. Still, out of that seemingly big budget, 73% is absolutely fixed. Uh, three components. One, the entitlement cost, uh, especially for the elderly. Two, subsidies for the local municipal governments. And the third is to pay back Japanese government uh, bond obligations. Um, these three serve absolutely no innovative purpose. You may say that Japan needs to grow in terms of its military capacities. You may say Japan needs to enhance its scientific research capabilities. You may say that uh, among the OECD nations, public uh, spending for public education is scandalously low. All these in order for all these to happen, you must um, make your pie chart bigger, i.e. you must grow. So for Shinzo Abe, since he came back in office December 2012, um, his economic policies and his pursuit as regards foreign national security policies were both uh, intertwined inseparable because unless and until the first part happens you couldn't pursue the second part and tax revenue being bigger than it was by 154 billion US dollars now you could uh, increase albeit um, incrementally the budget allocated uh, to Japanese Coast Guard. Speaking of which, 
the total budget of Japanese Coast Guard was smaller in amount than the one for Metropolitan Tokyo Fire Department's budget. Despite the fact that Japan's uh, EEZ is among the biggest, Japan is the eighth biggest nation in the world as regards its uh, coverage of the exclusive economic zone. Nonetheless, Japan's Coast Guard was extremely short of money. The same goes on uh, with uh, other uh, items, education, SDFs, and so on and so forth. But um, there is another figure, number, that I think is very much um, um, important. That is about the poll that the Japanese government started to take uh, since uh, 1963. So it's got a uh, uh, nearly 60 year track record. And in 2018, those who answered contended with life uh, was 74.7% uh, 74 and those answered discontented uh, were 24.3%. 74.7 positive, 24.3 negative. Both are historical high and historical low. If I may uh, add just one other thing about uh, Japanese economy, before COVID-19 uh, came to hit uh, Japan, the Japanese job market was um, uh, extremely in good shape. The, the, the best news perhaps for the younger generation is, if you look at uh, job seeking college graduates and job seeking high school graduates, the number is the same. Out of 100, that, let's say one, out of 100 job seeking college graduates, 98 earned jobs. Out of 90, out of 100 job seeking high school graduates, 98 also earned jobs. Coupled with the fact that the Japanese college tuition is still relatively affordable, there has never been Bernie Sanders phenomenon or Jeremy Corbyn phenomenon among the young. And may I say, uh, the younger you go, the generation table, the more uh, you found uh, who were supportive of Shinzo Abe. Womenomics. Um, some people puzzle, some people scratched their heads when Shinzo Abe started to voice uh, womenomics, started to stress how important it would be for Japanese society to be inclusive. Wait a second. Was he not from a family value background? Uh, was he a social uh, progressive? Uh, many actually uh, scratched their heads. Um, yes, uh, Shinzo Abe was from very much a traditional background, but he knows for a country such as Japan that is, that is losing its population, you must encourage all kinds of people to come back, if possible, to the job market. Um, admitted, admi admit admittedly, admittedly, the uh, glass ceilings for Japanese women are uh, still uh, lower, uh, substantially lower than those you have in the United States. And yet, when it comes to women's labor force participation rate for the age bracket uh, of 25 and 64 year, year olds, uh, this is an OECD figure. Japan in 2017, uh, uh, was about 74% uh, and the corresponding 
uh, ratio for the United States in the same year, 2017, was 70.9, 70, 70.9. Japan, 74. Uh, the United States, 70.9. Obviously, uh, this is the first time for Japan to outnumber the United States in terms of uh, female labor participation. Um, this um, was, um, of course, um, part of the um, social policies, but essentially this was also to give a um, uh, boost to labor input to the Japanese economy. Um, I have spent uh, nearly 20 minutes on Japanese economy. Uh, may I just uh, add one more thing before moving on to international affairs? That is uh, uh, some of the unfinished businesses for Shinzo Abe. The biggest one, may I say, is to uh, rewrite Japan's social contract. I've touched a little bit on Japanese entitlement, entitlement cost. Uh, another way to look at the Japanese welfare provision is to think about the total expenditure that's annually done to provide uh, baby care, child care, uh, elderly care, Medicaid, Medicare, that, those sorts of things uh, to generations of the Japanese and to look at the total number of uh, welfare spendings. And that amount, uh, allow me to uh, use Japanese yen, uh, is 120 trillion yen. 120 trillion yen. 60% of that is being covered by um, both the employees and the employers, but uh, the rest is being covered by taxpayers' money. And that's been growing year in and year out. How big this number is, 120 trillion Japanese yen, how big, how big that is? It is only slightly, it is only slightly smaller to the combined sum of US military spending, China military spending, Russia's military spending, Saudi Arabia's military spending, and India's military spending. These five nations being currently the five biggest defense spenders of the world. And the total welfare expenditure in Japan is only slightly smaller to the combined sum of the defense spending of these five big nations. Young people are aware of this. People in the 20s are all aware that down the road in their future, it's getting worse. They sense that. So uh, at the time that Shinzo Abe raised Japan's consumption tax finally to 10%, he made a pledge that the increased revenue flow, tax revenue flow, flow ought to be used more on childbearing generations, more on high school students, more on preschoolers, in order for the cost of childbearing education to be uh, uh, to be uh, lighter, if you like. No uh, parliamentary democracy, no, no democracy really could say to the elderly that you are the break, you are the negative uh, components of our economy. You could not alienate the elderly who are just in the United States uh, uh, most faithful in terms of um, casting votes. Uh, but uh, Shinzo Abe started rewriting Japanese social contract. And I think that was a brave, courageous act, which 
so far has ended um, uh, uh, midway. And that's a generational task, I think. Suga, his successor, one can only hope is going to carry the torch forward. And that uh, tentatively concludes our part on um, Japanese economy under Shinzo Abe. Now, for Shinzo Abe, it was absolutely necessary for Japan to grow economically because uh, people around the world, uh, people in East Asia, started to uh, 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 look down upon, frankly speaking, Japan as a backward um, country that had no hope for the future. And it was important for Japan to earn respect and recognition from the investment community as well, because you appear to be an opportunity. Uh, if you appear to be an opportunity yourself, then you could easily earn interest, attentions from the rest of the world. Along the way, Shinzo Abe uh, pursued his quad strategy. First, uh, the first thing that, she, first thing that uh, Shinzo Abe did, if you uh, recall, was to come to Washington, D.C., February 2013, and make the Japanese back speech, but more importantly, to say to Barack Obama that under him, Japan would be entering into the negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that uh, actually uh, um, struck a lot of people because uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, it, it was well known that uh, in uh, July that year, 2013, Shinzo Abe would have to face an ultimate test that is uh, the um, upper house elections. Something very much interesting uh, ensued after his pronouncement that Japan would be entering into the negotiations process. Um, agricultural lobby, agro lobby, centering around Japanese agricultural cooperatives lost their clout. They're there still. As, a, uh, as an entity to help uh, support farmers or to provide uh, finance, both to the farmers and to the city dwellers. Uh, they are there operating, so, uh, operating those, 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 those sorts of things. But as, a, but as a political entity, one of the things that's been very much remarkable in, in, in my eyes is that Japanese agricultural cooperatives have lost their political influence. And that's um, a um, chance, if you like, result that Shinzo Abe showed his determination to bring Japan into the TPP framework. Um, also, as the first big economic partnership, partnership agreement with a uh, agricultural centric country, Japan forged an EPA with Australia. So to enrich Australia-Japan relationship helped two purposes uh, to be fulfilled. Number one, to help enrich economic relationships. Uh, at the time when more and more Australian farmers and dairy farmers and even uh, industrialists started to shift their attentions entirely from Japan to China. The EPA with Australia helped bring that uh, shifted attention back to Japan. And also uh, when uh, Barack Obama openly said the United States would cease to be the world's policeman. It was imperative 
for the U.S.'s alliance partners such as Australia and Japan to help build the security framework together. Therein came this branding exercise of Indo-Pacific concept that Shinzo Abe first uh, touched on when he addressed the joint house of the Indian parliament under the title of Confluence of the Two Seas. Um, and then TPP materialized. Barack Obama, Shinzo Abe relationship was shaky at the beginning, but luck had it because Japan had a uh, most effective envoy of um, Barack Obama, Caroline Kennedy. And she, uh, hers is a rare talent, if I may say so, in terms of uh, freely ringing up anyone on both ends of the Pennsylvania Avenue. She paved the way for Prime Minister Abe to finally stand on the podium addressing the joint house of the US Congress. And uh, by so doing, Shinzo Abe gradually invested further into Japan's long-standing relationships with Australia, the United States, and India under the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific vision. And uh, in order for Japan to stand taller in the age that um, uh, your gigantic neighbor is wishing to rewrite some of the rules and norms long accepted by the international community, you must wave your banner. You must wave your banner that you are a long-standing democracy. And uh, long story short, uh, you could say that his poster is now being well received by an amazingly big number of international leaders. Immediately after the United Nations General Assembly last year, we flew, Prime Minister Abe and others, including myself, flew to Brussels. And uh, there, uh, Shinzo Abe with uh, the EU leaders forged two documents. One was EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, arguably, the biggest in terms of coverage uh, ever forged among industrialized democratic economies. There was a political document attached to the Economic Partnership Agreement, and it was called EU-Japan Strategic Partnership Agreement. And Shinzo Abe uh, gave a speech about uh, these two uh, deals, but with a, a stress uh, put more on the strategic partnership agreement and uh, uh, articulated that it would have to be democratic countries that ought to write laws, rules for the century to come. It would be almost as if Europe and Japan would be, would be the central pillars to sustain the international uh, regime. While uh, listening to Shinzo Abe addressing the EU uh, officials, um, I thought that Japan has come pretty much a long way. Finally, Shinzo Abe is the one among very few international leaders that has forged 
very good relationships with both Barack Obama and Donald J. Trump. I know that uh, Donald J. Trump uh, gave a phone call to Shinzo Abe on the 31st of uh, August, and it was very much an emotional conversation. Uh, he said that uh, the phone conversation was a good one, but it was a sad one. You and I have built special relationships. He uh, stressed uh, those points again and again. Uh, for Shinzo Abe, it was all clear that for any Japanese prime minister, it is the first and the second and the third most important thing to have and maintain the best possible personal rapport relationship with the POTUS of the day. That's what Shinzo Abe did. Um, one uh, can only hope that Mr. Suga, despite his relative um, inexperiences in foreign affairs, would nonetheless um, do as good a job, as good a job as uh, Shinzo Abe has done uh, in maintaining good relationship with the President of the United States, be it uh, Donald J. Trump, Mark II, <laughs> or uh, Joe Biden. Well, it's been 40 minutes, and I will stop here. I have not covered many other areas, and I would be, I would be happy to answer whatever questions uh, you might uh, wish to pose. So um, I will stop here. Dr. Akimoto, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taniguchi, for an uh, uh, insightful uh, talk. Uh, only uh, a person like you who, could, uh, who, were, who had worked with uh, Prime Minister Abe closely can make. If I may, I'd like to uh, uh, exercise the prerogative of a moderator and ask you a first question. Uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, people say or, or talk uh, as if uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is retiring from uh, uh, public service. Uh, but uh, uh, he himself said that uh, he's going to work for the country as a uh, lawmaker uh, in a press conference uh, where he announced uh, uh, his intention to step down. Uh, Mr. Suga uh, has been saying all the right things that uh, uh, he's going to uh, uh, carry on the mission of uh, Prime Minister Abe and uh, uh, seek, uh, um, possibly seek Prime Minister Abe's guidance uh, as he uh, uh, moved forward. What are the uh, uh, um, possible domestic as well as international roles that uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, may play uh, uh, from now on? He's still young and uh, uh, you know, he has uh, 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 tons of experiences uh, on domestic issues and the foreign issues. And there is a consensus uh, 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 among the high level of LDP that uh, uh, only uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe can handle uh, the relationship with uh, 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 President Donald Trump. Uh, uh, we don't know the result of the election, but uh, uh, what, what's, what's in for uh, uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Abe in the future? As you say, Dr. Akimoto, he is relatively young. Uh, he was born in 1954. Uh, on the 21st September, very soon, he will turn uh, 66. Uh, 10 years from now, he would be 76. Um, well, um, he will still be very much active. For the moment, however, uh, he will definitely have to spend more time uh, curing, taking care, taking care of his um, chronic illness ulcerative colitis. Uh, when we had uh, dinner together on last Friday, Friday last week, uh, he appeared in good shape, but skinnier, definitely. And um, uh, he, he had a glass of wine and uh, enjoyed the dinner. 
well, uh, he could not eat uh, the full volume of uh, the dinner and uh, he uh, did not drink much. So um, obviously uh, he is ill at the moment. That uh, takes a lot of care. Uh, beyond that, um, I think that uh, visiting dignitaries from abroad, if that would be made possible after, let's say, COVID-19, uh, many would uh, not leave Japan without uh, paying a uh, visit to Shinzo Abe. So he is going to remain something like a center of gravity for Japanese foreign policy. And uh, already people around him are pushing him uh, to use his uh, statesman-like position to uh, do good for Japan's foreign policy. What could he do? I don't know, but I have just pointed out he's relatively young. For the moment, he has to spend some time uh, taking care of his uh, chronic illness. Third, after uh, COVID-19 uh, has uh, been managed, then uh, uh, a lot of people coming to Japan will uh, uh, seek, an op seek opportunities to see uh, Shinzo Abe. And Shinzo Abe has got to uh, uh, use that uh, status for uh, better for the uh, pursue and pursue for, for the pursuit of um, Japanese national interest. Thank you very much. Uh, a Congressional Study Group of Japan certainly would like to uh, uh, see Mr. Abe uh, uh, in the next uh, trip to Tokyo. I would like to return to uh, Ambassador Melan Verbier. Uh, you had a question earlier. Go ahead, uh, Ambassador Verbier. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tanaguchi, for your uh, enlightening presentation. Um, you had mentioned womenomics, uh, and uh, I think by any account, Prime Minister Abe was a visionary in truly understanding that enhancing women's economic participation uh, in Japan was critical to expanding the economy to growing GDP. And I've had the pleasure of working with him some on these issues. Uh, but even as you pointed out about the significant increase in women's workplace participation in Japan, a high proportion of those jobs are part-time or temporary. And I wonder, looking back, given that the economic gender gap is still rather significant, is there anything that could have been done differently to close that gap more? Um, because, uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe has been recognized on world platforms, from the UN to the World Economic Forum for what he tried to do. Thank you very much uh, for your question, Ambassador Verveer. What you have just pointed out is um, very much uh, accurate and correct, uh, and no one could dispute. Uh, glass ceilings low, uh, pay gap uh, wider between Japan and the rest of uh, OECD nations. Uh, but to take a long-term view, this is just the beginning and uh, companies must recognize the need uh, based on their profit uh, calculations, based on their bottom line uh, calculations that uh, they should hire more and they should pay more. They should hire more women and they should pay more to them. Remember, this is a private undertaking, mostly. The government must be very much aware that it should be creative in providing the Japanese private sector entities with good enough incentives. The questions to be asked for Suga would be the incentive package that the Japanese government has so far given to the Japanese private sector is good enough to uh, uh, now to not to to make the wage gap narrow to make the glass ceilings low. Uh, under Shinzo Abe, the government of the government of Japan, especially the METI Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, worked together with with Japan Exchange uh, under the cooperate 
cooperative uh, framework, uh, there emerged uh, mutual funds that uh, put together companies that uh, have hired more women, that have uh, had more female members uh, of the managing board. You know, those uh, incentives might have worked and let's stock take what uh, difference uh, they have made and uh, be innovative. Um, and uh, uh, whether or not Japan should impose a quota of a sort to the Japanese companies about uh, the number of women, female employees and about uh, the wage gap. Uh, that's uh, a hotly debated issue. Uh, and I think uh, the discussion will, uh, is, will continue. But on those things, I'm um, hoping very much Suga being a problem buster, problem solver. Um, he's a self-acclaimed problem buster, but it is well known that he does uh, work efficiently when it comes to breaking uh, some of the uh, barriers. So uh, under Suga, I think uh, those are the things I hope that we'll see uh, more development. This is a little bit of a commercial, but uh, uh, we are having uh, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, LDP uh, uh, diet politicians, uh, female politician, giving a talk at the Sasagawa uh, very soon. So uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, people can join. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sinkin, you have a question. I read your interview in uh, uh, Sanke uh, recently. Dr. Sinkin. Uh, thanks very kindly. Yes, uh, Tom Sinkin here at the uh, Bush School of uh, Government and Public Policy's new uh, the campus in Washington, D.C. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Quick question for you. Um, as we look ahead under a Suga administration, uh, what do you feel the prospects are for a uh, U.S.-Japan uh, bilateral free trade agreement? U.S.-Japan bilateral free trade, free trade agreement um, was uh, discussed and signed between Trump administration and Abe administration. Um, there are areas still uh, remaining uh, addressed, uh, but I don't think uh, we should uh, be any way negative about the prospect. After all, Japan uh, 2020 is substantially different from uh, Japan 1985, if you like. Um, Japan is now, by accident, may I say, an accidental uh, torch bearer <laughs> of uh, liberal open trading regime of the world. Uh, Japan uh, pushed the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement forward, and that was uh, well uh, appreciated by the EU leadership, which again paved the way for the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. Of late, the UK-Japan free, tra free Trade Pact Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, the negotiation of which has reached its uh, framework, framework agreement, and soon the UK and Japan will sign the deal. Uh, and uh, not in the too distant future, the United Kingdom will also be joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, making TPP-11, TPP-12, although the United Kingdom is nothing but an Atlantic economy. So um, uh, Japan is uh, at the moment much, much more willing uh, to forge a big uh, economic uh, partnership agreement with uh, uh, industrialized countries, including of course the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. Chaco. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, thanks very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, it's a, a very comprehensive one. Uh, can I take you to back to the speech 
that you and uh, Prime Minister Abe worked on uh, August 2007 to the Indian Parliament. Uh, looking back, it was um, such a prescient speech. Uh, it spoke about a lot of things that have actually come to pass. The free and open Indo-Pacific concept, he is right there in the speech. Uh, in effect, the Quad and the Quad Plus he refers to. He speaks about peace through strength. Um, really, all these soaring concepts. Uh, in addition, of course, there were a lot of mundane aspects like, um, you know, 200 uh, business people as part of the delegation and, and all the potential deals that could be done. There was, um, he mentioned about philosoph uh, philosophers and scholars, Swami Vivekananda and uh, Okamura, Okakura Tenshin. So it was a really a remarkable speech, a really wonderful speech. Uh, perhaps, uh, I think, one of the really best speeches that he has given. Could you uh, throw some light on how the speech was put together, the kinds of input you received from the, the numerous parts of the Japanese government and outside, your own role in, in uh, basically helping the Prime Minister to articulate such a wonderful speech that was just not just words, but so many strategies, concepts that actually have come to pass, that, ha that the whole world has accepted. You know, the concept of the Indo-Pacific, for example, is something that uh, nobody thought would happen, but it uh, has been happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it leads me, I think, back a little bit at um, what went on in 2007 when uh, Prime Minister Abe and I worked on that speech. Number one, with all uh, respect to my friends and colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, frankly speaking, not, among, not only among uh, diplomats, but also among Japanese industrialists, there was not much appetite, if I may say so, in bringing Japan ever closer to India. So it took Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's strategic instinct to pioneer on many of those issues when Japanese industrial economic interests were not as uh, high profile as they would later become. Uh, which brought me much room to be creative and innovative. Because frankly speaking, there was not much substantial cost sunk already at the time between India and Japan. I knew that Shinzo Abe was already guided by his own strategic vision. I knew also then Indian leader, Mamohan Singh and Shinzo Abe were in extremely good terms. And third, I knew also when it comes to spiritual bonds that have bonded India and Japan for centuries, that is a unique kind of relationship because I knew also each and every newly appointed ambassador from India, without exception, has found more Hindi gods being worshipped in Japanese temples uh, that uh, appear to be Buddhist temples. And the sense of reincarnation, you know, those uh, uh, spiritual bonds uh, that still exist. You know, those are the three points that I knew that I would uh, take into consideration, that, that, that I would have to take into consideration in, in writing those speeches. By the way, uh, well, it uh, came from my pen, I admit it, uh, but uh, Peggy Noonan would, uh, would not say that uh, boys of Point du Hoc 
the speech uh, Ron, Ronald Reagan gave uh, on the uh, Normandy Day, D-Day, was hers. You know, it, it's not her intellectual property. Uh, uh, it, 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 it does not belong to Peggy Noonan's intellectual property. And the same goes with uh, my case. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, Prime Minister Abe uh, was uh, uh, experiencing a little bit of uh, uh, political difficulties this year. Uh, his uh, uh, approval rating was uh, uh, very low, and uh, there are inter internal and external difficulties that uh, 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 he was facing. Uh, soon after he expressed his, his intention to uh, uh, step down, his approval rate uh, has soared. Some uh, 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 result is uh, uh, over 70%. What are the res uh, reasons for this uh, uh, unusual phenomenon that uh, 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 approval rate soared so fast, so high? I think this question is important because uh, uh, it hinges on uh, longevity of uh, 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 this high uh, 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 approval rate. Uh, because uh, 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 it hinges on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, Mr. Suga's decision as to uh, whether or not to have a, a snap uh, election, and if he does, uh, when. So uh, if you could uh, address those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Japanese polls are being taken by major newspaper companies and network TV, key TV stations. And polls are being conducted uh, on weekends, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. About 10 years ago, they started to ring up mobile phone numbers. But uh, the vast majority of people responding to the calls from the poll takers would be the kind of people who uh, are not uh, being active on weekends. Suggestive that uh, the vast majority of those people polled may be slightly older, older than average. Indeed, if I were 23 years old and crossing the zebra crossing in front of the uh, uh, Shibuya station and all of a sudden get a call from Asahi, I would hang up saying I'm busy. Uh, but anyway, uh, Shinzo Abe chose to pay as little attention as possible to the polls. And his poll ratings dropped significantly twice or three times before when he pursued the secrecy bill and when he pursued the national security legislation, uh, none of which uh, was passed very much easily, but each one of which was very much important Number one, for Japan to finally establish its uh, intelligence community, something that uh, deserve its name, which could uh, seamlessly exchange intelligence with uh, NSA, CIA, MI6, Mossad of Israel, and so on and so forth. The uh, security legislation has finally made it possible for Jap Japanese self-defense forces to provide uh, security to US uh, ships and aircraft uh, as part of the uh, asset protection, quote unquote. Um, so this is not the first time for Shinzo Abe to experience uh, the nose diving of uh, uh, poll, poll ratings. If he had been healthier, if, had, if he had been in good shape, my sense is uh, he would uh, uh, dissolve Japanese parliament and call uh, another general election to boost his political capital in order for him to uh, pursue some of the uh, unfinished businesses, including the um, revision 
of Japanese constitution. And yet COVID-19 made it uh, practically impossible for major polls to take place. And uh, second, uh, people in Japan, despite the fact that Japan's death toll number still hovers around uh, 1400, have been rather unkind to the uh, undertakings done by the Japanese government. Um, but uh, looking back, I would imagine that more people have come to realize that uh, the long reign of Shinzo Abe has produced some tangible results both within Japan and especially uh, when it comes to Japan's external relationships. And I could say even the uh, uh, notoriously uh, Abe hater newspaper of Asahi uh, uh, carried a result of the polls that showed as uh, Dr. Akimoto mentioned, as much as 70% of people responded positively uh, to Shinzo Abe. Will uh, Mr. Suga uh, take advantage of uh, uh, Prime Minister's popularity, a wave, the, uh, I mean, the surf the wave to uh, uh, call general elections in the near future? Well, that's one of the things that many people are speculating on. But uh, Suga has been vocal, both in words and in his body language that uh, it is not an opportune time for uh, him to dissolve the parliament and call uh, general elections because uh, uh, gathering of people uh, in massive scale uh, could still uh, uh, entail uh, clusters of uh, COVID-19. But I don't know. This is something that uh, long regarded as an area where you could uh, say uh, false things, uh, i.e. make a lie. Thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Mr. Bharat Josh. Mr. Josh? Yeah, uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Akimoto. Uh, I'm Sorry, uh, uh, Tani Guchi Sensei, for keeping my camera off, but I am in a low network area. Uh, sir, my uh, question is essentially about uh, the Abe era. And in India, you know uh, Professor Tani, Tani Guchi very well, the sheer popularity of Abe San the person. And as we look back at the Abe era, as it's already being called, will the India-Japan bilateral be, uh, be seen post and pre-Abe. So in, in some ways, the question is, is the Modi-Abe friendship, is this period going to be remembered as the golden period in the bilateral or are greater heights yet to come? A related question, sir, is with all of the changes in the region right now, very much uh, in no small part driven by Abhisan, uh, were things like the Quad and the Indo-Pacific, of course, which have gone from strength to strength. And from the Indian perspective, this will certainly strengthen. But some other frameworks like the RCEP, uh, at least from the Indian perspective, uh, may not really work out as we had hoped. What is your perspective, sir, with the big change of the leadership in Japan, uh, both for the region and for the bilateral? What could we perhaps expect? Thank you. Frankly speaking, the amity between Modi and Abe is um, uh, unique and uh, no one could actually replace with Abe when it comes to his strong relationship with Modi. In that sense, I am inclined to say yes to you that Modi Abe era was the golden era of India-Japan relationship. That said, it is almost uh, self-evident 
that for the future, Japan will need India even more than it does now. Why? Because the eastern coast of the African continent uh, is a playground where great game is being conducted among many players, notably China. And remember Mozambique is extremely well endowed with its natural resources. So as everyone says, Indian Ocean is, the, is going to be the industrial corridor highway for the decades to come. And that would influence the quad nations of United States, Japan, Australia, China as well. It's far better now for India and Japan to continue pragmatic, realistic, down to the earth, cooperations on many fronts, so that when it comes to rules making, when it comes to uh, uh, safeguarding the maritime uh, uh, trading connections, uh, it would not be undemocratic nations, but democratic nations that have to come together. So my sense is the golden period of uh, India-Japan relationship uh, forged uniquely by two individuals may not continue as is, but uh, the importance of India-Japan relationship is going to gain uh, even more salience uh, in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dani Hakim, go ahead. Hello, uh, Professor Taniguchi. I have a question from Israel. Uh, given the historic moment today with the signing of the peace agreement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel and Japan's commitment to promoting peace in the Middle East, using their positive relationship with the Palestinian Authority and Iran, do you think that Mr. Suga, with his reputation as a pragmatic problem fixer, will have a role in promoting peace in the Middle East? And do you think that the Tokyo Olympics is an opportunity to push this course? Well, if I may say a little bit to uh, the audience, uh, Mr. Hakim uh, is uh, been heading uh, uh, his own um, uh, attempt of uh, bringing the Palestinian kids and Israeli kids together under uh, 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 budo, such as judo, karate, and so on and so forth. I've been aware of that uh, attempt. Now, Suga is faced with a learning curve of a sort. He's not the person who has uh, been well versed in issues such as those in the Middle East and he needs a uh, substantial amount of homework uh, to catch up with the reality. Um, the good news though, is that he's been surrounded by extremely well talented, experienced, sure hands from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from other sources. So he will very much quickly catch up with what Japan has done in the Middle East and in the context of uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So for instance, uh, Suga will learn that one NGO based in Tokyo has been inviting high school uh, female students, both from Israel and from Palestinian region to let them spend 10 days together, mixing up with um, same age uh, girls from Japan in the, um, in the middle of um, deep forest up north in the Yamanashi prefecture. By the time they uh, wrap up and uh, come back home, uh, they uh, spend uh, a lot of uh, sleepless nights and exchanging uh, views and some painful experiences. You know, that's a quiet kind of diplomacy uh, that's been 
pursued not necessarily by the Japanese government, but by private individuals, uh, NGOs. Suga must take advantage of those assets that Japan has, because after all, uh, for, 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 for this momentum to snowball, uh, Japan has a play, has a role or two to play to um, make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. When we talk about uh, uh, promoting peace, uh, particularly among uh, uh, young people uh, in Israel and Palestine, Palestine, I, um, Olympian uh, Mr. Yamashita uh, came to my mind. He has been putting together uh, young children uh, 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 of countries that are uh, uh, um, not on the good terms and uh, having uh, uh, certain success, uh, not just uh, in the Middle East, but in Asia and other places. And talking about Mr. Yamashita, you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe has been uh, big on uh, vision and the values, uh, progressive Western uh, uh, democratic values. But at the same time, he has been very practical with uh, uh, other type of leaders, such as uh, Xi Jinping of China. Uh, and uh, uh, Erdogan of uh, Turkey. And uh, um, one uh, um, of such leaders uh, that uh, Prime Minister Abe had a uh, uh, quote-unquote good relationship with uh, uh, President Putin. But at the same time, uh, many people see that uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, no, almost no progress uh, uh, that we can see in terms of uh, uh, Northern Territory. Could you describe uh, 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 Prime Minister Abe's approach to uh, uh, Putin and, uh, uh, and also Xi Jinping, uh, two uh, big neighbors uh, uh, to Japan, and how uh, uh, um, he tried to uh, achieve the goals uh, uh, with those two countries. About Xi Jinping, may I say that only after he did uh, quite a lot as regards uh, cementing Japan's uh, ties with other Quad nations, he went to Beijing and exchanged smiles with Xi Jinping. Remarkably, China has been extremely vocal in its body language. Let's admit it, never once for, for the last uh, 100 days or even more, China uh, has chosen to send no ship, no boat to the Senkaku area. The Chinese have constantly daily provoking Japanese territorial integrity, trying to provoke Japanese territorial integrity. What then has Xi Jinping said of Shinzo Abe's interest in changing Japanese constitution? What has Xi Jinping or his party comrades uh, said about Japan's recalibrating its helicopter ca capable uh, uh, carrier uh, to be able to accommodate F-35? Nothing. The Chinese have kept uh, silence that is very much conspicuous about Japanese undertakings of this sort. The Japanese uh, uh, Defense Ministry and National Security Secretariat started to do, uh, discuss uh, equipping Japan with um, standoff missile capability, that is basically cruise missile capability, uh, about which China has said nothing. I would imagine one could only speculate uh, about uh, these things. My uh, uh, theory is Xi Jinping has uh, understood that it is not necessarily an opportunity, good enough opportunity to make a verbal assault to Japan when Japan under Shinzo Abe has relatively succeeded in uh, showing to the rest of the world that uh, it is well connected with like-minded democratic nations in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond in Europe. Um, 
so Shinzo Abe has done uh, pretty much a um, uh, uh, calculated uh, in a good way uh, diplomacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. COVID-9, by the way, has um, uh, prohibited uh, the uh, planned visit of Xi Jinping to China, uh, Japan from happening. Uh, what uh, will Suga do uh, is going to be something very much, uh, uh, is going to be something that would uh, gather much attention uh, from within Japan and without. That's about China. Putin, Northern Territory, well, is, uh, is an emotional issue for many. Uh, that's true. But it is also true that the average age of former residents of those uh, islands up north of Hokkaido are in their 80s, mid 80s. Very few people, very few people would say that they would be interested in coming back home and live in those islands. Their, their, their strong hope is that they would like to visit their ancestors' term, tomb places uh, at their own will as frequently as possible. For Mr. Abe, the waters, water areas around those islands will bear even more importance in the future when the Arctic navigation route uh, is going to be even more commercially viable. Um, so um, the seas around those uh, islands might end up might end up becoming another area for uh, great uh, power rivalry. Japan needs to build its position in those areas. And I think that's what uh, has driven Shinzo Abe to try hard to forge a peace treaty with Russia and thereby bringing back uh, administrative rights and sovereignty uh, from uh, those islands. And Vladimir Putin uh, figured that it was also an opportune time for this to be made possible during and throughout 28 bilateral meetings that Shinzo Abe <clears throat> had with uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and during those many tete -te meetings, uh, they had the mantra they shared went uh, something like the following, if not now, when? If not you and I, who else? And that much being the shared commitment between Putin and Abe, and yet we all know that it's gone nowhere. Uh, the Japanese aid package given to Russia, by the way, involved actually zero amount of taxpayers' money. So the damage uh, was not so much significant, but I know that Shinzo Abe took a sigh of disappointment looking at uh, the fact that no result, tangible result came about after all these years of his uh, personal commitment. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Taniguchi, you have a, a final word and uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I would appreciate it if you could touch upon uh, uh, the most uh, uh, memorable moment that you had with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, in your close uh, uh, professional, uh, personal association with him. So thank you. It's been extremely fulfilling seven years and eight months for me. Uh, it's been taxing uh, for sure, because in order, for, in order for you to be able to write uh, speeches for 
your prime minister, you have to be able to spend many, many sleepless nights, which I did willingly. Why? Because I knew that he is very much committed in lifting Japan's uh, place higher in the world. The most rewarding moment, needless to say, came when I was watching Shinzo Abe addressing the uh, members of the Joint House of the U.S. Congress, uh, ending his speech by referring to his favorite tune, You Got a Friend, and given a description to the U.S.-Japan alliance that the alliance must be an alliance of hope. At that moment, I thought the U.S.-Japan Security Pact, when it was first forged between uh, Roosevelt and Yoshida, um, that was about uh, uh, the um, uh, end of uh, the Second World War and about uh, preparation for the Cold War. When uh, Mr. Abe's grandfather, Kishi, forged another pact, uh, it was about, it was all about Cold War. The U.S.-Japan Security Alliance lost its direction tentatively, as we all remember, uh, in the late 19th and in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And watching um, Kishi addressing the Joint House, I thought, now the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance has gained another brand new direction for the future. He shifted the narrative of the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance from the one looking backward to the one looking forward. That was the moment, Dr. Akimoto, that I felt most rewarding. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much for spending lots of time. Uh, it's late in uh, uh, Tokyo and uh, uh, you must be uh, uh, exhausted. Uh, good luck with your uh, private sector life. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you have many roles to uh, play uh, in the future as well. I know uh, uh, all the participants are extremely busy people and uh, there are lots of uh, uh, other events, activities happening uh, 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 in Washington in your life. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in and uh, uh, making this event uh, uh, worthwhile. And uh, uh, I really appreciate it. As I mentioned during the event, uh, we are inviting uh, a leading uh, a female diapolitician uh, uh, very soon and uh, uh, you will receive uh, invitations. So thank you very much for uh, uh, tuning in and uh, uh, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.